Okay. Well, thank you uh, again. <laughs> uh, so my first question is, you're from New Jersey, right? Yeah. Northern. Uh, born in Washington, D.C., the Virginia, oh. Washington, okay. D.C. area. Moved around on the East Coast a little bit when I was growing up. But yeah, you could say New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia area. Okay. The tri-state area. Um, there you go. And, they, and you went to school in Ohio. Right. Okay. Ohio State so University. What? What took you to Japan, and why did you end up staying? Well, I, I I guess it was that move from the East Coast to the Midwest, which is what I wanted to do, get away from uh, the area that I knew quite well into an area that was, uh, um, I had no idea about Ohio. I, I actually um, wanted to go to Purdue as well in Indiana, just to completely get away from where I was to experience wow. that. Um, Ohio State was great because I got to meet a lot of international people. It's such a massive university, and I got hooked up into this community. Um, my roommate, that's a whole completely different story that I, that's fascinating, but my roommate um, who went to high school with me, he moved away in our junior year. I never saw or heard from him again. And one day at the Commons where we eat breakfast, there he was sitting at in Ohio State University I hadn't seen him in two years and he was a good friend of mine. We didn't have the internet so much back then in 1990, 1992, 1993. So I was like, what? This is crazy. So we became really good friends again and ended up being roommates for the, the rest of the time there. And he was fascinated with oh. Japanese culture. Um, you know, I'd had a bed, he had a futon. He, he's like this very unusual um, dude. Wow. Uh, he's, he's dorm room. A, <laughs> yeah it, well it, it, we moved uh, on off-campus housing yeah, yeah. and uh <laughs> he was very much into the japanese lifestyle which was bizarre to me um but he ended up coming on the jet program to japan and after university i ended up backpacking before i went into the workforce i wanted to see the world i had family in india i'd never visited and that turned into uh me wanting to do more travel so i was keeping in touch with my friend. We had email by then, by 97. And he said, you got to come to Japan. Uh, the JET program's awesome. You're going to have the time of your life. And you haven't visited Japan yet. You got to come here. So I took his advice and I, I um, didn't get into the JET program. I went to Washington, D.C., was completely, um, I don't know. It's, it was scary to be in there because everybody was a Japanese major, could speak Japanese. They looked the part. <laughs> and they went, went into an interview. There's three chairs. In the, there's a chair in the middle of the room and there's three chairs on the other side with these really old gentlemen over there that look pretty intimidating, no smiles, shooting questions to you, very Japanese style. And uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, the fact that I got an interview is pretty, was success to me. So I went in through another company called uh, Amity Eon, which teaches children. And, and I came into Japan that way. Um, the funny thing is my roommate left Japan and never returned, and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and Everybody's then, journey here is so roundabout. Yeah. Well, so you ended up in Japan. You were teaching, and I've I've watched you on like uh, on on your on your live streams and uh, on a NHK maybe uh, when you've appeared on NHK talking about you used to teach English. Um, how did you get on NHK? Because that's to me that would be like. Wow, he's on NHK World, you know, cool. Well, it's a lot harder now than it was when I first started. There was a, it was sort of a word of mouth type of thing where if you knew the right people, you were able to um, get jobs based on the need that they had at the time. And there weren't as many foreign residents in Japan in 2007, 2008 compared to now. Uh, it's very easy to see Western faces. It's hard to differentiate the, the residents here. But uh, I had a, a really uh, wonderful person um, meet my mother on Hachiko oh. intersection. She wanted a picture taken. So she asked this Western looking lady who happened to be a, uh, a journalist for the Japan Times called Angela Japs, uh -huh. um, who'd been here for, for decades. And uh my mother and Angela became friends. And so I wanted to go meet Angela. And then she ended up interviewing me for the Japan Times weekend section in 2004. Interesting. And, uh, I be and I became friends with her too. So we ended up talking. And then she introduced me to a good friend of mine now called Adam Fulford, who's been in Japan for, for decades as well, who was working on a show called Tokyo Eye. 
and I sat down with him and I became I friends almost instantly, but was highly recommended by Angela, who was good friends with him. And he needed somebody for the show and said, hey, I can I'm working with the show. Why don't you join us here? I just finished a BS Fuji um, shoot uh, for teaching comedy a Kaiwa, which is what I was doing on iTunes before I was doing inbound uh, tourism, introducing Japan to everybody. So this is a pretty good, cool gig. Uh, and then, boom, there you are. I, I was working on uh, NHK for the first show, but it wasn't so much getting in. That was hard, I guess. It was to keep the job, because if you didn't do such a great job and the producers didn't like you, you wouldn't be asked back, because there's no full-time jobs for NHK for this kind of gig. Yeah, Not really. You're like you, a guest, you're, um, you know, all the time. Something like that, but the producers seemed to like me, and I, I got good responses from the monitors, these people that are out there watching. So they kept bringing me back, and uh, eventually, I guess you, you you can't kick me out of the show. I'm part of the, the show's DNA, but the, that is that run ended one of the longest shows, if yeah. not the longest show in NHK World. Um, Sixteen years uh, it was. Tokyo on. It was I crazy. was a good show. I, I was sad to see it go. You could see over the years, both me and Chris, the navigator Kepler, age, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> over those years, it was a wonderful show, but we'd kind of gone, I don't know, we, we, we'd done ramen about 20 times. We'd done Tokyo Sky Tree and Tokyo Tower about 30 times. So it was, uh, I guess it was just time to maybe change the format and uh, who knows what the future holds, but um, my time with NHK helped set up what I do now and I right. guess my path. Uh, came through NHK. Well, lucky for you that this thing called the internet and YouTube happened. <laughs> so absolutely, how, tell me about Only in Japan. I mean, for people who don't know what Only in Japan and Only in Japan Go and Only in Japan Three Hundred and Sixty, I guess, are tell me tell tell the viewers a little bit about Only in Japan. Its purpose, you know, how you see your role in it. Well, I, I can start off by asking you a quick question, Gil. What what does only in Japan mean? I mean, before I did the show, when you when you saw the terms being used, only in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> what did it be? It wasn't really voice. a pop. Right. Um, it didn't seem like a positive thing, right? Actually, I mean, having been born in Japan, in Tokyo, but then raised in the U.S. since I was eight, and really loving Japanese culture, being familiar with it, and, and Japanese food, of course. I um, When I heard only in Japan, what it evoked was all the, like, kind of the weird things, the unusual things that Westerners perceive as being, oh, God, that can only happen in Japan. Um, but the fact is, your videos, you've been doing it for a long time. You know, and and now you're you have control over it, and you you don't do stuff. It, it's only in Japan is the brand, but I don't think of it as stuff you're, that you're covering things that are unique to Japan. You're you're covering things that are of great interest to people all over the world, really, uh, that are in Japan and the places that you go and the things that you show and and the food that you uh, you experience and. Uh, you know, like I'm so glad that you don't you don't make like of faces with something and <laughs> <laughs> well the way I see it is is because I also knew you from you know uh NHK and you're still on NHK from time to time. Um I see you as more of a journalist than a lot of the other kind of expat YouTubers in Japan. Uh, who do a great job. There's lots of interesting stuff going on and people do uh, have specialties like camping in Japan <laughs> and stuff, which I'm not that interested in. The stuff that you cover is stuff that I'm interested in. And it is, you cover it from the perspective of a Westerner who's very familiar with Japan. You've immersed yourself in Japan for decades now. And, and it's uh, per perspectives that I can trust. And you approach it as a journalist. You know, you, you get permission when you take cameras into places. And you, you mentioned that. That stuff is so important. And you well, there's research. a way to do it in Japan. Well, yeah, yeah, you have to. 
I think if you want to be successful on YouTube these days, it's very competitive. You can't do what everybody else is doing, which is the initial reaction to any YouTuber who starts. This YouTuber is doing good and they have a million subscribers or 10 million subscribers. So I'm going to do kind of the same thing. That's a failing recipe right now because um, although you are different, the concept is the same. You need to come up with something that is almost radically different that gives yeah. viewers a different point of view. So you're not competing with that person with 1 million subscribers or 10 million subscribers. How do you compete with that? You never will. So in that sense, um, when I started, and again, I, I'm glad that I asked you what does only in Japan mean? That's exactly why I took it, Gil. That's why I, <laughs> yeah, when I, I, I was thinking of names, I said, you know, that doesn't have such a, a positive thing. It's what people think is silly about the country. Right. But that's exactly, that's the perfect name because I kind of want to um, almost maybe correct those misconceptions or yeah. show them the reality. Or um, I guess if you have a lot of, a lot of even journalists, Western journalists will not give historical context or a Japanese point of view to stories. Mm -hmm. And this gives a greater un misunderstanding that continues uh, to just perpetuate over and over um, like the Kanamara Matsuri, which is this strange uh, festival down in uh, uh, Kawasaki, which is completely misunderstood, especially by the foreign media and completely ignored by the Japanese media, which we can well, we can really? talk about at the end of this. We can talk about this at the end of this. But Ex explain the, the Matsuri, series... Ex explain that festival in, in right. like three sentences. <laughs> um, the 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 phallus festival <laughs> but well all right i i can't now i can't go look now i can't leave it at that can i so yeah. i have to explain a little bit so in the western media this is the phallus festival you right. see lots of things and for foreign <laughs> foreigners coming to visit japan that's the attraction they're like wow japan is just so weird i gotta go yeah. and see this and take pictures Only of it <laughs> right and then the the Japanese media completely ignores the most. This is the most well known festival for foreigners coming to Japan, which is sad. It's in every guidebook. It was on. It's it's it is. You, when you see the images, you can't forget them. So what I did with my show was I went down there, and this is sort of the DNA of what I do. I went down there. I called the shrine's uh, head priest, got access and permission to film. I went down there and interviewed her. It's a woman um, about. Um, why this festival takes place and how she feels about its image, both in Japan being ignored and uh, in the West being completely maybe misinterpreting the reason that this shrine even exists. It seems to have taken on a life of its own. Even the vendors that sell objects are selling phallus um, popsicles, phallus uh, taiyaki. It's crazy, some of the stuff. And you see people eating that. It's like, whoa. And her response was not what I expected, but it was so vital to understanding the the core of this, of what she's trying to do, the message that's just lost because she doesn't do interviews. No one's ever asked her, uh -huh. which is ex extraordinary yeah. to me. The shrine was set up um, in the 1980s. Um, there was this uh, AIDS blood transfusion problem where Japanese didn't, didn't know a lot about HIV AIDS and yeah. blood transfusions. People were getting it through no fault of their own. So there was a place that people would go with these kinds of diseases, and it was the shrine. The Yoshiwara in Yokohama was not that far away, where the ladies who had diseases, had nowhere else to go, would go to the shrine to seek comfort. And that's what they've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And she was asked, and they, they did this festival and nobody picked it up, but she was asked by an um, uh, LGBTQ I'm not sure the, the term exactly, but uh, from the community here, which doesn't get enough representation right? Um, to be to have a float of their own to help give their struggle to be recognized. And that is a pink phallus, which is an undeniably different than the dark wooden ones that are more representative of the other festivals around the country. A pink one is just like crazy with the. Uh, um, uh, members of the community there in in drag, which yeah. is awesome, but also bizarre. And uh, she felt a responsibility to to not say no to them, yeah. and so she let it go on, and it started to almost snowball out of her control. I think, and the festival, though, I mean, it had that core meaning to it, but that was never 
that was never even in, in the foreigners' minds that visited and, and saw it or in the Japanese minds because they didn't know what to think because she'd never expressed herself on why this is taking place. It, it blew my mind. So that episode is is sort of the core, and this is on my old channel, the core of what I, I want to do with the channel. But, uh, geez, that was... Uh, how, now, I, now that you brought it up, now that we brought it up, I couldn't, I couldn't let it go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. It's fascinating, and it is. It, it shows that you do cover things, just you know, dig up things, research things that other people uh, may not know about, or you know, I mean, I've seen so many, and I, I love them. I watch all of them. You know, I love, you know, Asakusa, Asakusa, as you say, <laughs> Asakusa. Asakusa. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but there's so many videos of that street food here. And, you know, and uh, uh, more and more, I'm starting to see videos of Yanaka Ginza, which is an area that I love. And I love because it isn't overrun by tourists. And I'm kind of afraid that next time we could get to Japan, it will be overrun by tourists. Because of all the videos that have been shot recently, um, but I love that you go out and away from Tokyo as well to parts of Japan and look for things and like like Wagyu. When you when you cover Wagyu, you cover the industry. You don't just sit there and eat some Wagyu and go, "Mmm, it's melting in my mouth." You know, you that's part of it, but you research and you talk to the farmers and you. I love that you go to the farms and, and actually kind of do recording on the industry and the auction and, you know, all of it. I think it's, you give people a, a, a more a well-rounded perspective and context for the culture that's in Japan. I think that it's important. Um, it, like, I, I, I don't know if I consider myself a journalist or not. I did write for my college New, well, I, I was a photographer for the college newspaper and I helped a lot of writers. <laughs> I don't think I have anything <laughs> in print there. But I, I do have this curiosity, a great curiosity. And I think every journalist needs to have that to dig and to, to understand things. And in order to do that, you need to talk to people. You need to um, research the subjects. Um, but more than that, you need to get access. And in Japan, that's probably the most challenging part. I think in the U.S., it's really easy. You just can call them up and they'll say yes or no. But in Japan, they want to have meetings. They want to have blueprints. They want to know exactly what you're doing. They want to know how many people are coming. They want to reduce risk as much as possible because they know their own reputation is on the line. But if you can, you know, they want to see your business card, for example, something a lot of Westerners don't even bring when they come to Japan. So <laughs> when you can put their minds at ease with a lot of these things and jump through the hoops that they ask you to, you can get what, what's called simply access. And that access allows you to see behind the scenes, like at a Wagyu farm, how do they raise the cattle? But instead of just eating the beef, I'm really curious of what makes the beef so delicious in the first right. place. How did that marbling come about? What makes each brand special? What's different between Miyazaki Gyu and Kagoshima Gyu, which won the Wagyu Olympics right. last year, to uh, Kobe Gyu, which everybody, Kobe beef, which everybody knows Everyone worldwide. Knows. Yeah. You know, obviously in Japan, Kobe beef, is one of the top brands, but it's not number one. We would say maybe Matsuzaka beef is maybe even a little bit more famous than Kobe beef in this country, which is bizarre to Westerners who come here. So I, I, for me, I, I'm, I'm doing a balance of not just introducing this because I live in Japan. I have to do a really good job of it. At least I feel I do because it's Japan's reputation too. It's yeah. not just mine. So I have that approach when I, when I, when I do these stories and on YouTube, I, I just don't think, you know, a video can be popular for a day or two, but if you want it to be popular for five years or so, you really have to do a good job with it. Um, news stories that come out on CNN, BBC, any kind of media, they're there for one day and then oh. you never really ever see it again, right? right? What I make, I'd like to say, would stand the test of time. I want to make it well, like a painting or something oh. like writing a book. You want people to, uh, or are interested in this topic, to make it the de facto source of information and if i can do that just like uh, the last episode speed wrapping which nobody had really ever done before i thought that was, awesome. it was something <laughs> <laughs> i tried to find those kinds of topics that haven't i don't 
it's like everybody sees it. It's right in front of you, but no one's ever really dived deep into it and asked the question why and how. And yeah. if you can get access into it. You can really blow people's minds yeah. on the reasoning why they do it. I mean, it's obvious, but to hear people say it, yeah. you know, there's a traffic light over there. The traffic light turns green for 60 seconds and turns red for two minutes. We want people to catch that green light. So we make sure that we wrap it like, what? You're thinking about the traffic light? Yeah. That's crazy. No, so for me, I, you know, I shared that. I shared that episode, the speed wrapping episode and uh, on my Facebook, uh, you know, uh, wall. And it got so much response and 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 people saying, I love that. And I never knew that. And. You know, so that's that's the role that you play. So uh, actually, I love hearing, you know, from you, your purpose and why you do what you do and, and, and kind of how, how you do what you do. Tell me the difference. And, and first of all, I guess the 360, is that a thing still? Uh, it's an evolving technology. Um, I remember when I released the 360, it's a virtual reality where you yeah. can... Um, like either use goggles or wipe around the phone. I had a woman who fell out of her chair and hurt herself. <laughs> and she she was going like this and she hurt herself. And that made me worry a little bit. So I kind of stepped back and I said, we're not quite ready there with the technology yet, are we? Um, and the viewers were not really there. Um, so I think it's something that I'll step back into this year. I have a, a brand new 360 camera right here on the table. So I'll, I'll, uh, oh, good. I'll, I'll, I'll fill that in. But it, it is an immersive way to do it. And if you're going through something like Fushiminati, where you're going through these uh, 10,000 you know, 20 gates, 10,000 20 gates, or you're <laughs> in a, a small alley, there's you could really feel it in that kind of a format. Yeah. But for yeah. me, a, a 360 camera is just another tool where now you can play around with that. You you never miss an angle with that. So I use it yeah. quite a bit, but I could I could put that together into a 360 show. Well, we'll, we'll see how that works out. But Okay. Well, tell me about your two main channels. The... John Daub's only in Japan, and uh, and the only in Japan Go, which is I mean you're super prolific, and I don't know if you feel like you have to do X number a week or something. Um, I I think your followers must notice when you take some time off and do, you know, have family time or something, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm but, sure. And and uh, but I also. Partly because of my interest in journalism and the way you you tell your stories, you know, it's one thing to to have a live, you know, stream like uh, only in Japan go when you're in a place or a situation or going down an alley or whatever, and you're describing stuff and talking to us and looking at comments and you know you're interacting with your audience, which is something that 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 normal media can't do, mainstream media, but. I also really love your edited stories um, because that's where your kind of your thoughtfulness and ability to put things into context uh, comes into play. And I think that's just great for, for Japanophiles, for people who are curious about Japan. And I just think you're a really great educational resource when you, when you do the, um, you know, your, your main channel stories. So uh, just want to, you know, keep keep pushing you to do those. I know their work. I I understand editing together stories is a real pain in the butt, and and uh, and you have to really plan them in advance. Most of your main channel stories they are kind of offshoots of live streams, right? From the Go channel, like you go someplace and you live stream, but also you're kind of plotting out things for a main channel story. Yeah, for me, you know, I think we touched up on a little bit on this here. This is uh, for the main channel. Let me start off with the live streaming channel real quickly. So mm -hmm. the history of that, um, the technology hasn't been around for very long to be able to live stream mm -hmm. on the road with usually would be a van with a satellite dish yeah. and you need a team in order to do a live anything from anywhere for media. But um, I was in 2017 and, you know, we had a stream and we had all these other things. It was really pixelated. You can kind of get an idea. You felt sort of like you were there, but it wasn't until around 2016, 2017 that the technology really got there with 4G LTE and the camera sensors and everything within the smartphones. So I did a hitchhiking trip and I didn't want to be alone. And it was, it would, you know, you're out there on your, by yourself. So I would live stream 
um, the trip while it was going along there. And I found that people, first of all, they really love the live streams or they really hated the live stream. So there are people who love it or they don't. So I can't have a channel with both of them. I need to separate them because uh, it really is a different, it is a completely different muscle yeah. for journalism to do yeah. an edited and do a live. Yeah. Um, the live, so that's how the live streaming channel was born. It's, it was an experiment that went right and it has done wonder. It is so awesome, Gil. I cannot tell you how <laughs> closer I feel to my, to the community because yeah. I'd never before this actually really met people. And when yeah. you see them in the chat, you're, you feel like you're meeting them because you're sharing an experience live. Yeah. And that's how you get to know people and people know you. So that interaction it has been everything to me. Even when I feel sad or I'm not, you know, maybe feel upset, I'll just do a live stream and sh introduce something to somebody, and it makes me feel better. Some people learn about something, yeah. And we we have this great, great connection um, through the medium. Um, so I absolutely love it. But again, it, that's like an experiment where I can do stuff that are micro as well. That mm -hmm. I think, do I, I really want to spend two weeks on this? Or can I just do it as a live stream? And but it's important to introduce, yeah. so I'll have to make that judgment. Um, for the main channel edited content, the stories are immersive because for me, it's about an idea, and it's like the hunt. All right, I, I'm I'm in the same mentality. I have an idea. I have a story. I know this is going to make a great episode. I gotta I gotta get that story. Right. So you start writing stuff down. You start to to blueprint it, plan it out. You get the access and the permission to go and do it and you get that story and you tell it. Sometimes you don't even know what the story is. It evolves as you're taking it because you're learning all this new information that wasn't available to you because you're there on the spot. And uh, that's, that's, I, that, that is one of the most intoxicating, super exciting parts of this job and why I'll probably never, ever stop doing it. Because for me, I don't know how different that is to other YouTubers, but it is, it is, it's more than a job in a way. It is like an obsession sometimes. <laughs> like this Wagyu, I'm doing an episode on the Wagyu Olympics and I'm just obsessed with how Japanese judge the quality of the beef, the details of it. What is it that made my, Miyazaki Kagoshima win? Because yeah. to a layman's eye, which I am, I can't understand what the difference is between the cattle from yeah. Gifu and yeah. Miyazaki. And, you know, these brands are different, but what's actually, is it really, you can taste the difference? I, I wanted to understand that. So I'm fascinated by that. And it, it's taking more than two months to make one episode. And um, I guess it's more like a documentary, but uh, to get in depth into a topic that you know is going to fascinate yourself, you know it's going to fascinate your audience. And that's, yeah, that's true. Um, that's where a lot of that, uh, there is a passion behind what I do. Yeah. And that's where it comes from. Curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Curio and you know what? That you kind of said and kind of poo poo the idea or question whether you're a journalist. You don't have, I don't have a journalism degree. I have a BFA in painting, but I've been a journalist all my career just because I, I have an expertise in certain things and I have curiosity. That's the number one thing that journalists must have is curiosity. And you are expressing your curiosity with your both the, the live streams and the edited stories. So I just think it's um, uh, I look at what you do and I go, damn, what a great life. What a great career. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I, I, I bow down to your to your uh, <laughs> no, different mediums <laughs> i'm a huge fan of, of your writing in fact i have the book right here <laughs> top of my show get it now on amazon <laughs> thank, any you, book thank store. you um <laughs> you know it's been a while i guess somebody has done that recently but when you're doing your live streams i know foreigners recognize you and come up to you and you used to give out those cards uh but um do japanese know you too do, they, do people yeah. know who you are? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do domestic news programs every now and then. And when they have um, need an analyst for inbound tourism, because I've been doing this for so long. Yeah. My Japanese is not, and my Japanese isn't even that great, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty good. interesting. And 
it's interesting and passable enough for TBS Hiroobi, which is maybe the biggest morning news program, like a meet the press type of a thing, yeah. which is crazy to me when I get into the studio because everyone is a massive star. You know, I'm sitting next to um, Damon, who is, you know, this this rocker who knows everything about news and sumo and one of the most smartest people that I've ever met in Japan. And he's sitting next to me. There's an actress on, on my other side. There's Megumi-san, who's the host of the show, a huge you know, personality himself, and I'm I'm t teaching them about the, my perspective, which is unique to Japan, and yeah. that has brought me a little bit of um, I don't know, notoriety here. Yeah. As well yeah. as I used to teach, I used to have the number one Eikaiwa, which is the English language teaching podcast on iTunes for many years. Really? I still get recognized for that. Damn. Yeah. That's cool. And that was twelve. 13 years ago so uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay well in all your time how long how many years have you been in japan Thir 1998 heisei 10 so that's 25 years this year this year 25 years okay this year um what's your favorite thing about japan and you can't you can't say like, kanae and leo you that's know, a loaded question. <laughs> but what keeps you there? <laughs> what, why stay in Japan? Besides Kanae and Leo. It's, like it's a fun. simple it's a simple answer, Gil. It's it's home. It's yeah, just okay. simply home. My my career is here, my work is here, my friends are all here. Um I'm just used to it. I did go home in 2003. I'd been living in Japan for 6 years, uh 5 or 6 years. I went home for a little bit and I wasn't quite sure. That's why I came back and I did this hitchhiking trip and that sealed the deal. I really got to understand about Japan's core. I think it was just a mystery to me. There are foreigners who will just live here and not understand why they live here. They just yeah. live here. Those are foreigners usually that'll be that'll return in a year. And I don't even like to call them foreigners. I, I guess just internationals or, or something. They're, it, it's a community that, that's very much needed here in Japan. But everybody has a different reason to stay here. For me, it's just simply home. And it, that's, we, I think when you watch Only in Japan, I'm telling you about my home. And that might not make a lot of sense to you because no. I'm not Japanese. But it does make sense. As an American, it just makes yeah. sense, right? As an yeah. American, it makes sense to me to be a part of Japan. But to Japanese, they don't see me as Japanese, which is fine because my value would be diminished if I were Japanese. <laughs> so I'm happy with who I am. And there are foreigners internationally that would would prefer to be like Japanese they try really hard to assimilate I don't want to assimilate because my value is to be different yeah and I think um ah, in that sense that's really a yeah. interesting I hadn't ever thought of it that way in that perspective but you like being the gaijin I that, absolutely do in, I mean I don't mind it yeah, it's not, it's not that I like it. I don't mind it. And I see the value in it in, the, yeah. in this era. Yeah. Because right. I, I'll be honest with you and, and, and to the viewers here. If you were, let's just to say, hypothetic, I did speak perfect Japanese and I did all the manners and everything perfectly. Even then, I still would not be seen as no. Japanese. Even if I had a Japanese passport and I became a Japanese citizen, which a lot of people are... They have you know, There's an increasing... They have done that. I have friends that are not Japanese citizens, there, and they were born in the United States. So um, even then, you're not really accepted as, because you, you well, look different. Everybody you look different, right? Is, right. And this is changing an amazing amount now because of the, I guess, what they say, half or well, people half, now yeah. of mixed races mixed race, here are yeah. now becoming TV personalities. Um I know, I know uh, several of them. I've worked with them, including Chris Pepler, who was the navigator of the show, who's half American, um, and Horan uh, Chaki, who's a big TV talent. Uh, she's half, I believe, uh, Irish, and she looks it too. And, and this is starting to change the way the perception. But again, my value is not to be Japanese; it's to yeah. be Western and and go naname diagonally to understand the Japanese side and the foreign side and I can yeah. put um, see how I'm doing it with the screen and I can yeah, put yeah, the I two it, together in an, an original <laughs> an original yeah. slice of <laughs> Japan which hopefully is interesting to both Japanese and Westerners and I think I can do that which is why 
they asked me on that news program in Japan. <laughs> and also, That's, I could get okay. sometimes like BBC and CNN interviews to explain it from the other media side yeah. too. And That's fascinating. You know, and yet for for Japanese Americans, like I, you know, I grew up, I was a kid in Japan. I feel like I have pretty good pronunciation, but a very small, like a childlike, you know, Hasai, eight-year-old vocabulary. And um, and when I'm in Japan, Japanese people know immediately that I'm not Japanese. I am a gaijin, a foreigner, just because of the way I walk and I talk and I look at people and the way I dress. And they, they just, they... I had a vendor, a chestnut vendor once at Asakusa. So I said, uh, hi, domo, domo. And I walked away and he goes, you're welcome. And he went back and said, <laughs> how did you know? That's... Wow. <laughs> and he goes, mm, feeling. <laughs> so you know, okay. feeling that I'm a foreigner. Body like, language, yeah. clothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's not limited to just and for for everybody who's Japanese American watching this, it's not limited to just that because I'm half Indian and when I go to India, they know walk, yeah, they know body language, clothing, yeah, um, and the fact that I just don't speak the language exactly the same way, the accent, and uh, I I can't I can't speak Hindi very well. <laughs> I don't want to insult anybody, but, but uh, even if you if, if I do the accent, they're like just just stop. <laughs> <laughs> don't try <laughs> so, but they, they, people know and and uh you know inside america because they're just such an am amazingly diverse country yeah. um you, you can't but here outside the, people know and i think it's again i you can take two tacks with it i kind of enjoy it i like being the outsider um i'm not sure how great. japanese americans would feel but uh yeah. no i think that's that probably good advice i should like just kind of accept it and and enjoy the fact that I'm the outsider, uh, that that I'm going to be a foreigner. I'm not. I'm well, not. I'll, I can. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you. I I think for the Japanese, and if you see it from their point of view, the fact that you are not Japanese makes you more fascinating. It makes you more interesting. <laughs> it makes you. It makes you. It means that you have different stories to tell, and yeah. in conversation it can be a real asset. So I think sometimes we think too much about how people are judging us and looking at us. And we think our initial reactions are to think negatively. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes not even the case. We just see ourselves and we judge ourselves maybe in that, in that sense too yeah. much. But I, I've always, my experience here though, has been if, if I were, if I weren't born, I wonder if, if I would have the same confidence that I do as or well. Or impact, or, you know, or, or in, accent. Absolutely. Right? Interesting. Um, I was shy, Gil, when I came here to Japan and through university. I taught children, and children saw me as a rock star, and I got confidence <laughs> from kids. I'm not joking. <laughs> they, they gave me confidence to stand up and be a teacher and teach them and to be funny and, and express myself the way that the kids express themselves. Yeah. And that helped me break through a wall which is, you know, important, I think, especially for YouTube. So I, I give a lot of credit to the kids who taught me a thing or two here in Japan. That's great. That's great. Now, I, I only have one other question, really. And, and, and I don't know if this is a touchy subject or not. You've mentioned it in quite a few, you know, uh, live streams, certainly, uh, especially when you're in Shikoku. But are you thinking about really moving outside of Tokyo? Yeah, since, uh, you know, we have a family now, we have a son, he's going to turn two next month. And he's adorable. I, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's pretty smart. I'm surprised he's going to, he's growing up bilingual in Japan. He's, he speaks more English than Japanese. And I don't, I don't know how other than, Oops. you know, I, I, I talk to him, not like he's a kid, but like he's my friend, I guess. I don't know. It's weird, but he's picking up both languages uh, quite well. And, you know, I, I see that in Tokyo, it's just, it's not, it, I grew up in the suburbs and I had a lot of fun. I was able to ride my bicycle places. It was basically like Stranger Things on, on uh, Netflix, <laughs> that drama where you were able to go everywhere with your friends and a lot of things that maybe we can't do even in the suburbs today in the U.S. But it just seems like for me, to my core, Japan is my home. And it, I didn't say Tokyo is my home. I said Japan. And I think that there's a lot of places where I could do a lot of good. 
Uh, it's more not a question of me and whether or not I want to move. The answer is yes. I would love to get out of Tokyo and live in Kyushu. Miyazaki and Kagoshima are amazing. I love Aomori as well. Maybe not the winters, but there's just so much diversity <laughs> between the yeah. Pacific. They have the Pacific Ocean and the Sea of Japan. Yeah. And Hokkaido is just right up there too. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, and the food is incredible. There's so many places that I, I could live. The hard part, you know, is, is to determine where I would want to move to. It's not that simple. When I came here as a teacher, I I was I lived in um, Okazaki, which is in Aichi Prefecture. Mm -hmm. um, that castle was where uh, the shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu was born in that uh, castle. I lived across the street from the castle. Mm -hmm. I really liked the the Mikawa uh, Nagoya area too. Yeah, I don't think I want to live there. My my favorite countryside area is probably Hiroshima, um, the city. I, I, even though the city is not a countryside, but I do like Shikoku as well, although it is quite off of the <laughs> track, off yeah. of the path. there's there's, there's no shinkansen down there yeah but uh iwakuni i lived in iwakuni for a couple of years a year and a half with my my dad was uh stationed or you know worked at at the uh marine air base there and uh we went to we lived in japanese neighborhoods and my brother and i went to school on base uh american school and uh, Iwakuni is a nice place. Uh, Kintai Kyo, the bridge with uh, you know the arches. I love that bridge. Um, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I see I, that. I, I, I see, see that too as a possibility. Yeah. Iwakuni does not have enough uh, foreign residents living there to help them with some of the attractions. They have a castle up there. Yeah. They've got a lot of really wonderful things. The marine base is, yeah. is also there as well. So, but you know that, that's a different. <laughs> it's completely different from what I do. Yeah, yeah. There, there's no, there's no, there's no place in Japan that doesn't have an attraction in my eyes. Yeah. Even these small towns that they feel they can't even find their own attractions, I go in there and I see hundreds of them. Yeah. And they all start with exactly. the people. And yeah. every person, every every restaurant, every place has a story, and that's what see, that's fascinates where, me. Yeah, that's. That's where your storytelling, your ability to, to be kind of a, a journalist, uh, uh, you're, you're thinking in terms of stories. You see people, you see businesses, you see attractions, you see milestones or things in the landscape. And, and, and you, in your mind, they become stories. And I think that's, that's just so cool that you, you see the stories everywhere. Uh, Kyushu is a pretty cool place. I like Kyushu a lot. It My, is pretty cool. My wife's family, uh, her father's side is from Kumamoto, the land of Kumamon. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kumamon is everywhere, believe me there. But um, but yeah, I, I, I love Tokyo. I love the big cities. I love, you know, Kyoto, maybe too many tourists, but, you know, the, the culture of Kyoto and Nara, uh, the, the the food in Osaka. Uh, my mom's from Nemuro in Hokkaido. So yeah, mm. it was so cool when you went to Nemuro. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... Um, Japan is a pretty cool place. I, I look forward to going back, uh, you know, soon. And uh, I will definitely look you up when I'm there. It'd be great to... Uh, share a meal or something absolutely you might have to come and find me though <laughs> i'm all <laughs> over the country I you are well, up in Nemuro. come, uh, come and join me up in Nemuro. i'll be up there again maybe in, in later this month oh really episode. okay yeah well, I, I made I'll friends with know. the guy who has a yeah I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that but absolutely that'd be great to to hook up for lunch and, and uh share yeah. some uh, wagyu or something yeah here. um when you are in Nemuro, and I think I've emailed you about this before, I've made a comment on YouTube. There's a restaurant called um, Dorian, D-O-R-I-A-N, like you know, the picture of Dorian Gray. It's in it's in Nemuro. It's not a very big city, so, uh, and it's run by a, a a Japanese man who who's the son of the the owner, and um, he's a chef, but he's also a Beatles fanatic. He has like I think a, I I ate there. Oh, you did? Okay. Is it across from the Eon supermarket? Yes, it is. It is. That's I ate there the second night audience. I was there. 
<laughs> I know, oh, he ended I up. He he, yeah, it, 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 this is just like coincidence. He he ended up. The, what the restaurant wasn't too busy. He ended up coming and he sat down next to me and he started yeah. to talk to me while I was here. And then he was showing me places where I could film uh, the Hanasaki line, which is a train line. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was being, great. It's being crowdfunded train line. It's a crazy yeah. story, but he would sh he great. was telling me all these places, and you can see the Beatles all over that store. It's like this 1960s paradise inside there. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> he, he collects guitars, and uh, my uncle used to love going there to eat. Uh, he passed away a few wow. years. It was my uncle's favorite restaurant. So we've eaten there as a family. And Shohei, the, the owner guy, the young guy who, who who's a Beatles fan, um, he follows me on, on Facebook and, and I follow him on Facebook and it's it's fun. But uh, okay, yeah, that's right. I think I saw that you went went there and I was so glad. But um uh yeah, we will we will connect when I'm in Japan. I will send and I'll try to give you as much warning lead time as possible so that you can, <laughs> you can tell me if you're going to be in you know okinawa or someplace you know uh, kagoshima or uh, uh kumamoto kumamoto is great because of uh aso the uh volcano uh it's, it's a beautiful place so uh cool well i'll let you go i've kept you much longer than i should have and i appreciate your time and um We'll connect again uh, in person. Absolutely. Thank you. Here yeah. Right. <laughs> we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot, John. Appreciate it. Thank you, Gil. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>